Today we are celebrating Trinity Sunday, and my sermon is based upon the gospel, which we heard coming to us from the third chapter of St. John's Gospel, beginning in the first verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, my dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ, as we heard today mentioned in St. John's third chapter of his gospel, we are witness to a conversation between our blessed Lord and Nicodemus. Now remember that Nicodemus, as he is referred to as, excuse me, a ruler of the Jews, in other words, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the interesting thing for us to remember as a little bit of trivia, if you will, is that Nicodemus is only mentioned by name in St. John's Gospel. St. John is the only evangelist to mention him by name. He's mentioned three different times. And again, in this third chapter that we're referencing today, St. or Nicodemus, rather, is conversing with our Lord. And basically, our Lord is stating that if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Specifically, it says in verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, of course, this confuses Nicodemus to no end because he is focusing on, the, on this term, being born again. He is apparently taking it literally, which if we put ourselves in his shoes and had never heard, heard that phrase before, perhaps we would have been just as confused. So I try to uh, give Nicodemus quite a bit of slack. But he's literally focusing on the word being, or the phrase being born again. And so our Lord makes the point to differentiate between the flesh and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Of course, that first spirit is capital S, spirit, meaning, of course, the Holy Ghost. So again, our Lord is differentiating between what is flesh and what is spirit. He's separate, separating. This isn't the first time, quite frankly, that we heard our Lord separating because elsewhere, certainly as we hear written in St. Matthew's Gospel in the 22nd chapter and the 21st verse, we hear the following. Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. The point that I'm making is this. Certainly, as I just referenced in St. Matthew's Gospel in the 22nd chapter, our Lord was did make a point to separate things of the world as opposed to things of God. He separated, he made sure, or he pointed out the division, I should say, rather. These things belong to the world, these things belong to God. But in this case, what our blessed Lord is saying when he states that which is of the flesh is of the flesh, that which is of the spirit is of the spirit, there seems to be a clear distinction. But in this case, it's not so much a distinction as a contrast. Keep in mind when we mention the word flesh, we are thinking about things of the world. As opposed to when it is mentioned as spirit, we are thinking about things of God. This does raise a very interesting point for us as Christians to ponder. Because as I stated, we who call ourselves firmly committed, dedicated Christians, Christians who take our faith seriously, 
not Christians in name only, keep in mind, because I am making a clear distinction. Those who make the distinction of being serious, committed Christians, they cannot separate who they are. This is what I mean. There's many places in life where we can separate. We can make a distinction and we can segregate, if you will, or segment, so to speak. For example, in my secular job, certainly where I work 40 hours a week, when I am there from 8 to 5, it's 8 to 4.30 actually, but I digress. When I am there during those hours, I do things that I am required to do for my job. But once my time is up there and I leave the job and I go home, I, I try as much as possible not to think about my job. Thus, when I go home or even on the way home and I have to do things, whether they be uh, running errands even on the way home to get things at the store for what we need at home or to get pet food, for example, which is what I uh, do very often when I leave work and go home. My time is mine is the point that I'm making. When I'm at work and when I'm on the clock and when I am doing things there at the office, my time belongs to my employer because I am being paid to do things on behalf of the employer. But when the, when the clock is over, when my time is over there at the job, my time is on my own. We can think of many other examples. For example, the point being is this, that as I've stated in the past, we wear many different hats. One hat we may wear is, as I stated, as an employee. Another hat we put on, we wear as a parent. Another hat we wear as a child. Another hat we wear as, as a spouse. Another hat we wear as, as a homeowner. Another hat we wear as, as a volunteer. Again, the list goes on and on. We can each one of us come up with our own examples. But again, the point that I'm making is this, is that when we wear the hat of a volunteer, wherever we're volunteering, whether it be at church or the local mission or at the food pantry or wherever we volunteer our times, that time is the volunteer's time. When we're a parent and we're wearing that hat, we are a parent and that's our time spent as a parent. Our time is divided among many things that we do, and each of us can say the same thing. We're a parent, or we're a spouse, or we're a neighbor, or we're an employee, or we're a worker. Again, the list goes on and on. We can each come up with our own examples. But we do multiple tasks in our life, and each in that sense to a certain degree, each one of these tasks or each one of these roles is, is segmented. It's divided. But yet, this is the point that I'm making. As a Christian, we can't segment our time. We can't differentiate. This time I'm a Christian and this time I'm not. So many people in our society do just that. If they do go to church, and keep in mind, I emphasize that because there's so many people that don't make a point to even go to church to begin with. But even with a lot of the people that do go to church, that make a point to go to church, even with a lot of those folks, they get all gussied up and they look, look all purtified by wearing their best clothing and getting all gussied up and getting their big hats and so forth. And they go to church on Sundays and they look real purty when they go into church. And they sit there and they look mighty fine. And when the hymns are sung, they sing real loud. And even when the preacher preaches, they're even louder when they say, Amen, Amen. 
But you see, when they leave church, they became they become somebody completely different, somebody that's not a Christian, or at least if we'd see it with our own eyes, we we'd say that person doesn't seem very Christian to me, doesn't seem to act like it at least. But boy, on Sundays, boy, they sure do look Christian to me. You see, we can't be like that. We can't segregate the times that we're a Christian on this certain day or in this certain time frame or in these certain circumstances, but we're not a Christian when we're over here. As a Christian, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Certainly, as we look back in the Old Testament and the Psalms, the Psalms are always wonderful to reflect on. And certainly, one of the wonderful Psalms that we can always look towards for inspiration is Psalm 34, verse 1, where we hear, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall constantly be in my mouth. As I try to make the point so often in my sermons, I try to state to you that it is important to know the context of which scripture verses were written or epistles were written or the reason why they were written. This verse that I just read to you is no different because this verse was written by David. That should be, we all know that the Psalms were written by David. But the point that I'm emphasizing now is this. David wrote that psalm at a particular time when he was at his lowest, if you will. You see, at the time, he was being chased by King Saul. And King Saul had it in for David. Why? Because he was jealous of David as the bottom line. Remember in Scripture where it says the people sang... Saul killed thousands, but David killed tens of thousands. And so this got this rankled Saul. This this got in his craw, so to speak. King Saul hated that. He despised that. And so he was jealous as a result. And so he had it in for David and didn't want anything to do with David and wanted, and wanted to kill David. And so that's why I say even at this time when David was being hunted and was in fear of losing his very life, he still was able to write this psalm that I just read to you. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. We should learn from that. And especially in that context, we should learn that at all times we are called to praise the name of the Lord because he has done so much for me. Elsewhere in the New Testament, in the fifth chapter of the epistle written to the Ephesians, we hear, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not always easy to praise God. I'm the first one to admit that. It's not always easy to praise God's holy name when things seem so down. But it's in those times that we need to praise God's holy name. It's in those times that we need to reflect on the fact that God has done so much for us, that God is always there for us. You see, when we realize that God is there for us 24 hours a day and seven days a week and 365 days out of the year, when we ponder that fact, it's easy for us to remember that we should be there for God 24 hours a day, seven days a week and 365 days out of the year because he's there for us that same amount of time. God is always there for us, and therefore we should always be there for God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.